Good afternoon, everyone. Rachel, why is this so tall? <laughs> I have never felt like... Okay, this is taller than usual, but it's really wonderful to have you all here. <laughs> um, I'm glad to see you all. This is um, our final Rosenfield program event, actually... Tomorrow's lunch, but actually tomorrow 4.15, but our final big Rosenfield event um, for this semester. And we feel that is a particularly um, auspicious and wonderful occasion. We are so happy to welcome back to Grinnell um, Dorje Garun, class of 1994. Um, and I know that he is probably someone familiar to many of you, if not all of you, in the crowd. Um, he's one of our distinguished alumni, and um, we've been working for months on having Dorje come and do a Rosenfield program alumni in residence. Yesterday he uh, talked to a select group over lunch about his work with the nonprofit Committed to Education, a group that is working to enrich and expand educational opportunity um, in starting with one rural village, but many other rural villages, he hopes, in Nepal. Um, and tomorrow at 4.15, um, upstairs in room 209, he will be uh, talking informally and answering questions uh, that particularly students might have about careers in international education. So I um, urge you to come back tomorrow and hear more of what he has to say. And then, of course, we will all be privy to um, our great honor to give him an honorary degree from Grinnell, an honorary um, doctorate from Grinnell, um, at commencement at the end of the year. Um, and so we've been, we're so pleased that we were able to uh, get him to still come and do the residency. Um, and it's really a rare pleasure to be able to have one of our honorary degree recipients on campus for almost a full month really before commencement and to get to hear from them in depth before we uh, will see them at commencement and it's a wonderful thing. Um, Mr. Grung is a, a well-known international educator, uh, particularly science educator. He's worked in many different countries around the world um, in a lot of different education positions. He himself is from a rural village in Nepal. Um, his great talent led his father to bring him um, to Kathmandu, where he pursued a Jesuit education. And then he went to Italy, where he studied, and then came to Grinnell College, um, where he received his BA in 1994. Um, he came to International Headlines, I know many of you know, um, last year when he was, t actually two years ago now, okay. last year, boy, it feels like two years, um, t last year teaching in uh, Qatar, um, where he was imprisoned on, this is my editorial comment, trumped up charges um, of insulting Islam and was freed after an international effort uh, to basically claim his human rights to be uh, let out of prison. Um, it's, it's still a controversy that is affecting him, but it's one of the m more admirable things about him that it has slowed down his educational career and his philanthropic uh, work, not at all, and it has given him the opportunity to do something he wanted to do, which is to return to Nepal to do this nonprofit work on education in Nepal. And so we'll be hearing more about those issues today when he speaks to us about human rights and the education of disenfranchised people um, in Nepal. So please give a very hearty welcome back to Grinnell to Dorje Garung. Thank you. Um, before, before I start my speech, the talk, um, I just wanted to say how glad I am, how happy I am, how thrilled I am to be back here. And... Uh, it's been quite, a, quite interesting moving around campus and being a little lost. Uh, it's changed completely, dramatically. And I don't remember North Campus being so close to South. Uh, I used to live in the South, and I used to be one of the bohemian hippies. and They've closed the gap, um, it seems. And they have to walk all the way to JRC for meals. What's that all about? <laughs> anyway, um, well, I've talked to a number of professors and um, others about the changes and so on, and I'll continue that at another time, um, and I'll come back to the talk. But, um, and, and, and thanks, uh, Sarah, for bringing me here and for the introduction. Um, thank you also to Rachel, where is she? Oh, right. Um, for all the work that you've done, uh, you did to, to bring me here, um, and plus the Rosenfield program team. Um, right, a lot, again, I, a lot seems to have uh, changed here, and I've been back in Nepal just for 11 months after being away for 25 years, um, and a lot has changed there too. Um, 
And unfortunately, unlike the changes here, um, a lot of the changes in Nepal have been for the worse. Um, and for the uh, marginalized people in Nepal, um, not much appears to have changed for the better. And uh, that's what this presentation is all about, about human rights and education of marginalized people of Nepal. I was born in a small village in the hills to a tailor family, a Dalit and therefore an untouchable family. From when I was a little girl, because we were so poor, I had to do a lot of chores at home instead of going to school regularly. When I would go to school, my Dalit friends and I were not included in many of the activities anyway, so I quit. I was sent to Kathmandu to work as a domestic help. In the city, I met a Newar man, a higher caste, who agreed to marry me and take me to his village. I had lied to him about being a Newar myself. Life in his village with his family was much better than in my own. Because they considered me a Newar, they included me in all the social activities and religious functions, until my in-laws discovered my caste. They then threw me, my two boys, and my two boys out. As I don't have any means of making a living, I've been struggling to provide for my boys. I want to go abroad to work, but since I don't have any form of identification, I cannot get travel documents. I don't know what to do. I was born into a Tharu family in the Torai, the southern plains of Nepal, which meant birth as a Kamaya, into a life of poverty and indentured servitude. Our days were spent tilling the land of our landlord. Our family got half of the harvest, insufficient, insufficient to feed us. So, every year, my family took more loans. We also sold one of my sisters into Kamalari. So one day, when a bro broker came to our village and sold my father the idea of sending me to Qatar, our family was finally able to dream of a better future. I could make 30,000 rupees, about $300 a month, much much more money than my family made, even in a year. All my dad had to do was take some more loans to pay the recruitment fees of 110,000 rupees, about $1,100. Since I would be able to save at least half my salary every month, he showed us how we would be able to pay off the debt within a year. Qatar, however, didn't end my family's suffering. Along with my dozen co-workers, I have not been paid for the last five months. I worry about my parents and siblings, especially my sisters. My colleagues and I don't know what to do. Who do we ask for help? Where do we go for help? We don't even know if there is anyone who could help us. I don't know what to do. I was born into a low socioeconomic background. And living in our village with my grandfather, I was destined for a life of limited opportunities. I wasn't meant to have even got, made it to school. When I did make it to school, the expectation was that I would drop out soon. Luckily for me, a teacher at this government school recognized my potential and told my dad to put me in a good school in Kathmandu. After being shuttled from one government school to another in Pokhara, I found myself enrolled at St. Xavier's School in Kathmandu. My parents were able to afford to send me there as the Jesuits subsidized the fees. The high quality education I was receiving as a primary school student when in grade five made me realize and decide that education would be my ticket out of poverty. My motivation to succeed and my dedication to my studies paid off when I won a full scholarship to the United World College of the Adriatic, an international school in Italy, and then admission to Grinnell College with almost a 100% financial aid package. Following my studies, I had a professional career as an international teacher for over 15 years, teaching in 10 different countries spread over five continents and traveling over 40 other countries. As you may have guessed, the third story is indeed my own personal story. 
The first two stories hold true of Nepalese belonging to marginalized groups, notably Dalits, women, and those belonging to ethnic groups such as the Tarus and the Tamangs. In the remainder of the talk, I will be doing a number of things. I will firstly be providing details of how these marginalized Nepalese suffer, both at home and abroad as described because of violation of, their, of some of their most basic human rights. Next, I will be describing what education is like in Nepal to show you how and why quality education will help marginalized Nepalese. And finally, what Committed, the non-profit organization I run with my friend Jayjeev, does with education to help them free themselves. I know quality education will make the difference to others from backgrounds similar to mine because it made all the difference to me. Nepal is a tiny country sandwiched between two Asian giants, India to the south and China to the north. Once a monarchical Hindu state, Nepalese social structure has always been hierarchical. There has always been the hierarchy of class, but it is also vastly stratified owing to the caste system. The two aren't very different because the upper caste groups are priests, rulers, businessmen, and administrators. They have always had access to land, political power, trade, education, and hence have maintained their status quo of the wealthy upper class. The farmers, day laborers, and others belonging to lower economic class belonged to the lower groups by birth and therefore profession. While in a number of countries I, I've lived and traveled in, social mobility was possible through hard work and education, not so in Nepal. Formalized in 1854 with the promulgation of the Nepal Legal Code, the Mulaki Ain, the caste system is based entirely on Hindu orthodoxy and classifies people into five hierarchical castes. At the top, are the wearers of holy thread, the high castes, the Brahmins and the Chetris, the priestly and the warrior castes. Next are the non-enslavable alcohol drinkers, the muggers, the gurungs, which I'm actually not, which uh, I'll get back to later, Rais, etc., mostly the hill tribes. Then come the enslavable alcohol drinkers, the Tamangs and people like myself from Mustang district referred to as Bhote, fall in this category. The fourth are the, are the impure but touchable ones, such as the Muslims and the Tharus from the southern plains. Then, at the bottom, are the untouchable castes, from whom the high castes cannot accept water and whose touch requires sprinkling of holy water. These are the Dalits, the occupational workers, such as the tailors, cobblers, blacksmiths, etc., and therefore unclean. Segregation of their residential area is the first and the most obvious way untouchability of Dalits is enforced, and their freedom and rights curtailed. All Dalits in a village are made to live on streets reserved just for them, away from everyone else. The following are some of the numerous other ways they suffer discrimination. They're denied entry into houses, restaurants, temples, and participation in a, or entry into social and public activities and functions, etc. They're denied access to community resources, denied equal, oppor equal opportunities to enter labor market, etc. High castes expect obeisance from them. And finally, they're made victims of atrocities more than others, such as, such as rape of Dalit women. These practices are more severe, are most severe in the southern plains. The following video made by my friend Subina Sresta, a journalist for Al Jazeera, is about the victimization of one such Dalit group. People in the Nepalese town of Lahan wake up to the sound of street sweepers, but they avoid them, afraid to even touch them, because they are from the dome castes. All Hindus are born into a caste system here, a rigidly hierarchical process that gives social status based on what people do for a living. 
The Brahmin castes are considered to be the purest, and the Dalits or untouchables are the lowest. Thirteen percent of all Nepalese are Dalits, and their work often involves dirty or so-called polluted things. And even within the Dalit community, there is a group called the Doms. Ramchandra Malik is one of them. When a person dies, the family has to buy the fire from us to cremate the body. Ironically, they say that a dom is needed for a safe passage for the soul. And it is the dom's association with the dead and death rituals that makes them dirty or highly untouchable under Hindu cultural beliefs. This well is used by the local community here, consisting mostly of Dalits. And yet, the domes are not allowed to touch this well, as they are considered to be the untouchables. Even amongst the Dalits, the domes have to wait for someone from a higher caste to fill up their pots. For Malik, the daily humiliation was too much to bear. When we'd go to restaurants, our friends would get served, but not us. So I organized a campaign to forcefully enter the restaurants. When we went in, they said there was no food, so we served ourselves. The higher caste did not take the defiance kindly, and the domes lost their jobs as sweepers. When the local administration refused to listen to them, Malik appealed to the district authorities. Now Malik is known as a neta or a leader. He was even a candidate in the last parliamentary elections. But it is within his own community that Malik faces some of his toughest challenge. One of the reasons people avoid the domes is because of their job collecting dead animals, and Malik wants to stop the practice. If you dispose of a dead dog, you get 200 rupees. When I tell them not to do so, they say, "Give me 200 rupees." Because they pick up dead dogs, people don't touch them. Overcoming the deep prejudice and stigma his community faces is an enormous challenge, and with all the problems in Nepal, those who are discriminated against are often forgotten. Sabina Shrestha, Al Jazeera, Sirdar District, Nepal. In the modern history of Nepal, many efforts have been made to uplift the status of marginalized groups. Laws were passed first in 1963 and then in 1990 against caste discrimination. Education was made universal, etc. Following a 10-year civil war initiated by the Maoists, elections to the Constituent Assembly were held in 2007, in which they won the majority of the votes. One of the rallying calls for ordinary Nepalese to join the armed struggle was a promise to create a just society based on the principles of equality, as summarized very well in the following clip from Journeyman TV documentary Born Polluted. Bishnu Nepali is herself a Dalit, and works in an organization aiming at improving the rights of Dalits. She is going on a field trip to Sarlahi, where the rat-eating Musars live. Here, in the southern plains of Nepal, the groups in the lower level of the caste system still live in utter misery compared with the low caste in the mountains. यदि दलितहरुलाई सबभन्दा तल्लो ठाउँबाट उठाउने हो भने दलितलाई एउटा एजुकेशन एकदमै महत्त्वपूर्ण कुरा हो स्ट्रोङ ल पनि भयो भने यदि आफूलाई अर्को मान्छेले अन्याय गरे भने त्यो पुलिसकोमा जान्छन् अदालतमा जान्छन् तर त्यहाँ नेर ठीक जस्टिस पाउँदैनन् The organization where Bishnu works helps Musars apply for citizenship papers, which most of the low-caste inhabitants of Jutapani don't have. The illiterate Musars were not aware of the importance of identification documents. The huge support to the Maoist movement can be explained by the fact that they aimed at breaking the age-old caste hierarchy. The rebels also gained support in Sarlahi, but after the peace process started, it has since died down. माउस्ट रुको पनि त्यहाँ पनि आशा थियो पहिला चाहिँ यो जब वारको समय थियो तर त्यति बेला उनीहरूको नारा थियो सबै मानिसहरू समान छन् नेकपा ए माओवादीले उठाएका सभालहरू पूर्ण समानुपातिक प्रतिनिधित्व नै हो सुरुमा त्यसपछि माओवादीले उठाएको दोस्रो सवाल भनेको जाति विभेदको अन्त नै भने हो र यो नेकपा ए माओवादीले पहिले उठाएका समानताका कुराहरू असमान स्थितिमा हामी त्यहाँ पनि फिल गऱ्यौँ 
The Musars work the fields of the high caste, harvesting five kilograms of rice for one and a half euros per day. They still live in total dependence of the region's landowners. The salary is not enough to feed a family with many children. The Musars collect the rice that drops on the fields during the harvest and hunt rats that live under the fields for food. Therefore, they are called the rat eaters. Not much has changed for the Dalits nor for other marginalized people, however. Women, the other marginalized group today, fare no better. The root cause of the problem is our patriarchal society. Sons are seen as the source of honor and pride for and as future caregivers of the family. They are also viewed as absolutely essential in a number of important Hindu religious ceremonies and functions. They are therefore given priority on everything. Daughters on the other, end, other hand are seen as someone else's property since when married they go and live with and take care of someone else's family. The following clip from two short videos, also by my friend Subina Sreshta, highlights some of the issues faced by rural girls and women. This one is about the difficulties pregnant women face in rural Nepal and the difficulties women and girls face in general. Survive. Birth in Nepal. Living in the city, it is easy to take everything for granted. The availability of hospitals, doctors, the state-of-the-art support. The sight of my unborn baby moving inside me is exciting. I'm told that I have nothing to fear. I have incredible support, and I'm sure that everyone here will do his or her best to make sure that I and my child will survive. <laughs> Yet, statistics say that every four hours, one woman in Nepal dies from pregnancy-related causes. I've decided to see for myself what the reality is for most women to give birth in my country. After two days of travel, we reach the village of Machkalo in Acham district. Here we meet 31-year-old Basanti Sarki. She has five children, three daughters and two sons, aged from 13 to 2. The sixth one is on the way any day now. Now that Basanti is pregnant, her 13 year old daughter Sunita has taken over most of the housework. Most daughters start working from as early as seven years of age. Basanti has no plans to go to the hospital, which is over five hours away. Even if she wanted to, she cannot find anyone to take care of her children. Just in case of possible complications, we decided to meet a local nurse, Lakshmi Upadhyaya, who is also a midwife. Basanti 
जनरल डॉक्टर हो है अभी हमीर तो असम जिला में एटा गाइनोकोलॉजिस्ट है सर्जन नहीं चाहिए तो भैदिग भाई बोका भाई मैं पांच छ घंटा अथवा दुई घंटा दुई दिन टाड़ा बा लिया राहत हो तो छेन हमीसंग कतिपय तो अभी गाँव में मर्स A newborn in the village means more work for Urmila, the community health volunteer. Some 50,000 women like Urmila, working around the country, have been credited for cutting down the number of deaths amongst mothers and children. <laughs> This one is about a traditional practice called Chopadi where girls are, and women are segregated every month for five days or so during their period because they're considered unclean. For five days every month, Bishna Bogote has to come to this shed underneath her house to sleep. In far western Nepal, menstruating women are not allowed to sleep in their houses because people consider them unclean. The older generations say that the tigers will come. They say that the gods will be angry. Many Nepalis consider menstruating women to be impure and untouchable. Um, this shed is absolutely tiny. It's impossible to stand straight. You can touch both walls um, with your hands. And this is supposed to be one of the bigger sheds. It's absolutely dark over here once you close this door. It's what happens in the dark that Bishna is afraid of. Many women have been raped. Many others have died, some bitten by snakes and others from asphyxiation after lighting fires to stay warm. A few hours down the road is the house of Ishwari Bhul, whose 14-year-old daughter was found dead in their menstrual shed. Sharmila Bhul was in the ninth grade. The parents don't understand what happened. Some say it was because of the lack of oxygen in the shed. Some say it was because of the cold. It was winter at the time. Even though the government banned the use of menstrual sheds in 2005, 90% of villagers still abide by the traditional rules in these parts. But there are some villagers that are trying to change that. In the village of Bhageshwari, last year, the men and the women decided that they needed to stop this tradition. They met with a lot of criticism. After we boycotted the tradition during monsoon, we had a problem. It rained all around us, but it did not rain in our village. Everyone said it was because we had stopped staying in our menstrual huts. It rained after a month. Then I told people, you said it would not rain, but it did. And our women are still staying home. There are women from nearby villages who stay on a rock all night. They may be eaten by tigers. We have to warn them. We're not happy that we're the only ones free from menstrual segregation. This used to be a community menstrual shed. Most of the other sheds have been demolished, but the women of Pageshwari have kept this one to remember how they spent many years suffering. Sabina Shreshta, Al Jazeera, Achan, Far Western Nepal. Even the law of the land gives more rights to men. For instance, law passed in 2002 on inheritance allows a woman to inherit her parents' property as long as she is single. Once she marries, though, the property belongs to her male siblings. As you can see, it's no wonder then that property and land ownership by women in the country is less than 20%. To be sure, women are underrepresented in pretty much every social, economic, and political sphere. 
Moving on to the next marginalized group, the Tharus in the plains continue to suffer as a consequence of past injustices. The Tharus property in the face of discrimination, poverty in the sorry, the Tharus poverty in the face of discrimination and violation of their rights is so extreme that they are currently indentured laborers in their own land referred to as Kamaya, some forced to sell their daughters into bondage called Kamalaris. Here's a clip from yet another documentary by also my friend Subina about their plight and the practice of Kamalari. Slavery in Nepal has been abolished by law. But behind the high walls of many city homes here, young girls continue to serve as slaves. Known as Kamlaris, they are the daughters of indebted farmers sold to landlords for little to no money. They were declared free in the year 2000, but Kamlaris are still kept by Nepal's elite, including government officials and decision makers. These people have the connections. If any case is filed against them, they are able to bend judgments to their favor. They are able to threaten poor families. They are the ones with land, and if they do not get camelaries, they may give the land to someone else to farm. But today, some are fighting back against Nepal's feudal traditions. June 2013. Farmer camelaries from all over Nepal are protesting outside the government complex in Kathmandu. Just weeks before, 12-year-old Kamlari girl Srijana Chaudhary had burned to death under mysterious circumstances at her owner's house here in the city. Outraged, these women who have all worked in servitude are demanding a full inquiry into Srijana's death and an end to slavery once and for all. It was a lonely battle for them. Political parties, human rights groups, child rights groups, all stayed away from the protest. When the women tried to enter the government buildings, police reacted with brutality. Srijana, like all Kamlaris, was from the indigenous Tharu community. Their history of subordination began 160 years ago with Nepal's first social order, ranking Tharu's almost bottom of the caste system, just above the untouchables. Their land was taken away from them, and they became bonded labor on the land that was once theirs. Srijana's parents rely on the goodwill of their landlord for access to land, and must give up half the produce they grow. They also gave up their daughter. We did not want to send Srijana, but the landlady came and said that I should send my daughter to Kathmandu. She said my daughter would become clever if she stayed in the city. Srijana's death became a tipping point for Nepal's Kamlaris, but there have been many others who have suffered at the hands of their landlords and owners. In the last five years, Four other Kamlaris have died under mysterious circumstances. 27 are missing from the homes they worked in, and 11 girls became pregnant. The government declared the Kamlari system illegal more than 10 years ago. Yet landlords still use their land as leverage to secure Kamlaris. Poor Tharu families often feel they have few other options and give up their daughters for little to no cash in return. And for many girls, their workplaces become dangerous as they grow older. The discriminations, the limitations and restrictions on the lower castes and other marginalized groups over pretty much the entire modern history of the country have continuously widened the economic rift. Shackled by poverty, increasing number of marginalized people buy hope in the form of passage to foreign countries they know very little about. According to the 2011 census report, almost 2 million Nepalese live abroad. Half of them were from the age group 15 to 24. 
About half a million left the country through legal channels last fiscal year, alone. Apparently, about 2,000 leave every day, legally. For every four that leave legally, one leaves illegally via India. A vast number of those are women under 30, going to the Gulf region because there is a policy against it. Heavily laden with debts, these semi and unskilled poor Nepalese migrants fall into yet another trap of discrimination, exploitation, and thus suffer from violation of their rights in the destination countries as well. Qatar is one of the most popular destinations. I myself was a migrant for over 15 years, traveling and working around the world as an international science teacher. In August 2011, my own movements took me to Qatar. I read about, heard, and saw with my own eyes how the Nepalese and other Asian workers were mistreated. In spite of my qualifications and experience, I wasn't spared the treatment either. I suffered from discrimination, discrimination and even incarceration in Qatar. Based on the words of his 12-year-old son, a Qatari family, a Qatari father lodged felony charges against me for allegedly insulting Islam and I was jailed. During my time in jail, I met other Nepalese who had also been incarcerated on trumped up charges. The most heart-wrenching story was that of a young man from the southwestern plains who everyone called Chotu. Chotu and the rest of the crew used to get together at the end of the workday to hose themselves down with an air hose. The procedure removed dust and anything else clinging to their clothes and bodies. One afternoon, one of them was taken a little ill after the process. Chotu and a few others rushed him to the hospital. Sadly, the man died two days later. Matters took a turn for the worse for Chotu and his friends. They were all charged with the murder of the man and sent to jail. Unable to speak Arabic and without representation of any kind, he did not know much of the details of his case, including how the man died and why he had been charged with murder. While all the workers jailed on trumped up charges, like Chotu, had no help from anyone, on the eighth day of my own incarceration, friends of mine had Doha News, Washington Post, publish my story. When friends around the world, including those from Grinnell College, picked up the stories, they rallied behind me and initiated a worldwide campaign to free me. Within four days of initiating it, the campaign had gotten so big that I was released. I returned home on May 13 after spending 11 nights and 12 days to the hour in jail. Since returning to Nepal, I've been working at times as an assistant and assistant and a translator to my journalist friend, Pete Patterson, in an effort to do my bit providing a voice for the voiceless. The following video, detailing the suffering of a fellow Nepalese, was shot on a trip to Janapur Pete and, my, Pete and I made last January. Tell you, I'm a minute guard, Pony, about ten to Ramdus from my good dinner. Dichard was a camos, the near Sotlinigo. Teskilago, which has a celebrity in Basno Glacia and Salafa. Mukis Missa Subunda Pilago, Bosni Gratina, Bosno Kele, Kotama, Chinese Samgiri Rutina, Bersi Rutina. I was able to get a little bit of 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 a little Nepal is a good thing. We have to do it. We have to do it. 
त्यहाँ अधिकांश साथीहरूको आइडी कार्ड थिएन एक सय साठी पैँसठी जना थियो त्यसमध्ये मलाई लाग्छ बिस पच्चिस जनाको मात्रै थियो भ्यालुएबल आइडेन्टी कार्ड त्यो थिएन त्यो नभएको खण्डमा हामी क्याम्प क्याम्पबाट कहीँ साथीलाई भेट्न जानु पर्दाखेरि पुलिसले भेटाएपछि समाएर लान्थ्यो अब समातेर लगेपछि कि त कम्पनी आउनु पऱ्यो छुटाउनलाई भिसा एप्लाई गरेर अब के कसरी हुन्थ्यो उनीहरूले मिलाएर ल्याउँथ्यो तर हाम्रो कम्पनीले के गर्थ्यो ल्याइदिन्थेन मान्छे मेन्ली हडताल गरेको कारण त्यही भने मैले दसजना साथीहरू होइन अब जसलाई अब अर्को महिना पठाइदिन्छु अर्को महिना पठाइदिन्छु भन्दा पनि तिन महिनासम्म मतलब बिना स्यालेरीमा पठाइदिएन उसको एग्रिमेन्ट पनि पुरा भइसकेको थियो र पनि पठाइदिएन त्यो साथीहरूले त्यसपछि सबैजनामा एउटा सम्मति गऱ्यो कि अब के गर्ने सबैको आफै त्यस्तै सिस्टम नै छ जसले पनि त्यस्तै गर्थ्यो आखिर मैले पनि दुई वर्षमा भ्याकेसन दिने भनेको थियो दिएन टाइममा दिन्थेन केयरलेस गरिदिन्थ्यो अनि सेलरी पनि नदिने तिनीहरूले फेरि सुताएर अनि कसरी खास के गरी भन्छस् त नि अब उनीहरूको नजरमा म त्यति बेला त्यो सबै मान्छेले बिगार्ने लिडर जस्तो भइसकेको थिएँ होइन त्यही भएर त्यति बेलाको मतलब सिचुएसन एकदमै गम्भीर थियो त्यति बेला कस्तो स्थिति आइसकेको थियो भन्दाखेरि मतलब कतै पनि केही नभए मतलब कहाँ फसेको छु जस्तो लाग्थ्यो कि त्यही भएर मैले भनेको थिएँ एउटा हिन्दी फिल्म त्यो डायलग भनौँ न जिन्दगी के तलाश में हम मौत के मुँह में आ गए भाया थे मैं है He was one of the lucky ones to escape with his life. Many aren't that lucky. On average, three dead bodies of migrants arrive at the Kathmandu International Airport every single day. The death of the breadwinner plunges the surviving family into, into even more of a precarious situation. The dreams of their children, for instance, the innocent victims, are shattered. To me, it's clear, beyond any doubt, that education freed me, twice. Firstly, from the shackles of birth in a low socioeconomic background in Nepal, and secondly, from a potential seven-year jail sentence in Qatar. Unfortunately, though, we, sh we still have major issues with our educational system. Considerable progress in literacy has been made since education was first made available to the masses in early 1950s. As you can see, at the time, only 5.3% of the people were found to be literate. Most of them were of upper caste. Notice, while male literacy was 9.5, female literacy was an abysmal 0.7. Fast forward to 2011 census report, and we discover 75% of males above five years of age to be literate, while the literacy level of females to be at about 57%, still considerably less than that of the males. As you can see, the situation is the same everywhere in the country. The census report does not provide any data on the literacy of different castes. The available data, which goes back to 1996, shows the level of literacy of Dalits to be less than half that of the Brahmins, the highest caste. To encourage more students to join schools, the Nepali government has put in place policies and programs such as free lunch programs, incentives for sending daughters to school, free education or special quotas for Dalits and girls and other marginalized groups. But the marginalized people, for a number of reasons, aren't benefiting su sufficiently from these programs. The following clip from the Al Jazeera documentary School for a Dollar shows how and why that is so in the southern plains where most of the disadvantaged people, Dalits and Tarus, live. Every village in the area is mired in poverty and the distance between schools is vast. In remote areas of Nepal, there are very few schools and the ones that do exist have poor infrastructure, even though they're supposed to get the same amount of funding per child as every other government school. Some locals have told us about some classes that are operating outdoors because the school can't afford to build classrooms. This is the Bhagashwari Titrana school. Locally, it's known as a sack school because children have to sit on sacks under a tree. 
There is a fragile shelter that parents built themselves and a few small school benches. We didn't receive funds from the government and so we raised money from the village to build this hut for the school so that our children can study. There are two teachers who don't even receive their salaries. There is lack of everything here. Funding for schools is determined by the number of students. Narayan Prasad Gamir is the president of a school management committee in the nearby Bara district. It's his job to verify the number of students, which determines the per child funding from the government. Some kids that don't even come at all. He admits he has to increase the numbers so that the school can afford to pay teachers. At our school, in the register, there are 120 students enrolled, but on an average, in a daily basis, 60 to 70 students come. He says officials in the district education office refuse to release money for books and new classrooms unless they're paid bribes. To make them happy, we have to pay bribes. There is widespread corruption here. The amount of corruption in the education sector in this Bara district is more than anywhere. To give you an idea of what a private school looks like, here's a clip from the same documentary about one in Kathmandu. Rato Bangla is one of Kathmandu's most prestigious schools. The quality of teaching and education is taken very seriously here. I'm Prachi Adhikari. I'm 13 years old and I study in Ratha Bangla, Grade 8. I really feel lucky because I think that Ratha Bangla has such a nice facility for students, like the studies and all are really great. And my hobbies are painting, I just love painting, and then singing, dancing. Art for me is a way of expressing my feelings. When I'm angry or anything, I just uh, pour it out in a paper and form art. I've been doing art since I was a child. I have a deep interest in it. The difference in the quality of education between private and government schools is reflected, amongst other things, in the results of the school leaving certificate examination, essentially high school diploma examination. As you can see, in 2012, more than three times as many students from government schools sat for the SLC. While private school results are good, government school results are abysmal. What's most alarming is that most stu students, about four-fifths, attend government schools and a government school, is, a government school student is four times as likely to fail. Qualifications of the population, according to the census report, are also quite pitiful. We have a population that consists of less than 10% that have completed a 12-year education. Literacy and qualifications, for obvious reasons, is important. But with the system of education in Nepal right now, especially in government schools, it is very challenging for most Nepalese children to get an education that is in any way practical. Forget about education that makes them lifelong learners, critical thinkers, problem solvers, etc, etc, etc. Long before my ordeal in Qatar, I'd wanted to make something of myself and make a difference in the lives of others from similar background through education. Just two months before the ordeal, I had decided to return home to do just that. So. Returning to Nepal last May, I was determined more than ever to help children of marginalized Nepalese realize their dreams through quality education. One does not necessarily need lots of expensive and fancy resources for that. Not in rural Nepal, anyway. At community, members interested, committed, where I work as the education program director, we believe in the holistic development of a community through the establishment of social business for education, 
SBE projects, which generate an income. Our current project site is Tangpakot village in Sintubalchok district. The indigenous population is Tamangs, another marginalized group. In addition to suffering from discrimination because of their lower status in the caste system, the Tamangs are also some of the poorest in the country. The district of Sindhupalchuk also has the dubious distinction of being the district where girl-child trafficking started. As you may have guessed, they still suffer from that because of poverty and lack of education. The following video provides a glimpse of Raithani school in Tangpalkot, where we work. Though it was made last June to woo potential donors to my fundraising drive, it gives you an idea of the school. I want to be a policeman. I want to be an engineer. I want to be a doctor. I want to be a nurse. I want to be a teacher. I want to be a doctor. We're here in Sindhapalchuk at the school that you're supporting. You've just heard the dreams and aspirations of the students. But there's a huge gap between their dreams and reality. The reality is that the school doesn't have enough classrooms. For instance, this particular classroom, they have had to put two different classes together. And right now, there are over 50 students in here. The other issue, the other challenge here is the quality of teaching. Although the teachers themselves are highly committed, they lack experience and they lack training to help the students realize their dreams. I'm incredibly grateful for the support that you provided me thus far. I need one final push to get us past the tipping point to help the children of Sindhapalchuk achieve their dreams. The social business for education being established in Tangpalkot is a cooperative-based fishery. The village community and the school are both directly involved in the planning, implementation and running of the fishery. We've already initiated it, setting up the first nursery cages in August 2013 in the school pond. Right now, we have four cages. The program calls for the expansion of the fishery into other natural ponds and artificial ponds, work on which is being conducted as I speak. When completely set up, the profits from the self-sustainable business will be used mainly to run and support free, mandatory and quality education at the school. Thus, the business will address literacy and quality of education and poverty amongst other issues. As far as literacy and quality of education is concerned, since a significant part of the profits generated from the proposed fishery will be used to cover the school's operational costs, the community will be able to offer free education. Families will no longer have to provide stationary, uniform or pay examination fees, etc. The community will no longer have to pay salaries of privately hired teachers, etc. The quality of education will be vastly improved as the fishery will be integrated into the curriculum. While integration with science will be relatively straightforward, I've already developed a document for that purpose, integration with other subjects will also be carried out. The education thus provided will be considerably more hands-on and practical, imparting useful life skills relevant in the village itself. And as for addressing poverty, Assistance to households will be provided to help them take up integrated fishery as an income generating activity, thus addressing livelihood issues and poverty. The rest of the profits will be spent on village development projects through a local government-led community planning process. 
In about a year and a half, we envisioned the fishery to be completely set up and run by the community. In the meantime, we've been implementing sponsorship programs supporting Dalit children and children of dead migrants. Our hope is that quality education will provide freedom to the children we serve. Freedom to dream unfettered and freedom to chart their own destinies just as I have been able, instead of being decided for them by others, as has been the case and is the case with thousands of marginalized Nepalese. And that brings me to the end of this presentation. Should you have, should you want more information, here's where you can find them. And you've been a great audience. Thank you. Anyone would like to ask a question? Raise your hand.